Well, good morning. Good morning and welcome to our worship. And to those to whom it applies, very happy July 4th. Uh, and hope you have a great day. And um, earlier in the week, of course, it was Canada Day, which I'm sure some were celebrating, although both countries are certainly facing their, their traumas at this time. But welcome. And a special welcome to any who are with us for the, for the first time. A very warm welcome. Um, and also, it's great to see some familiar faces return to worship uh, after what's been a, a, a long time away. Uh, for very good reasons with the, uh, all the strictures of the pandemic. On Monday there, as I mentioned last Sunday, we had the funeral of one of our uh, long-standing members, uh, Mary Painter, and the family were very keen that we should actually sing in church. And that kind of worked okay. You can, of course, have to keep the masks on, but today you're going to be invited to, to sing the hymns, albeit behind your, behind your mask, but uh, only do it if you, if you wish to do so. Um, and from previous experience, we know that there are those who we would rather not sing, so that's, uh, that's, that, that still applies. Just to let you know, we're continuing with our series on Jeremiah, um, but for those who are getting a bit fed up with Jeremiah, last week is the, next week is the last week of Jeremiah, so just a word of, it, a word of encouragement there. Right? Just stick, stick with it for another two Sundays. So let us worship God. Let us stand to sing hymn 153. Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father.
The greatest among you must bear himself like the youngest, the one who rules like one who serves. I am among you like a servant. Let us pray. Almighty God, we gather this day to offer you our worship and our praise. We come together as part of your church, part of the life of this congregation, your churches here on the island and your church in the world. Different peoples with different backgrounds and different ways in which to celebrate their faith, but united in a desire to acknowledge you as creator and sustainer of all life. The very stars in the heavens the beauty of this earth, our own individual lives, are all of your creation. And you remain involved in that act of creation through your Holy Spirit, seeking always to guide us, at times to comfort and console, at times to challenge and to prompt us to embrace new ways, new ways of doing things, a willingness to tackle the wrongs in our lives and in our society. And yet too often we turn from these ways, for we can be too easily motivated by selfishness and self-centeredness. In so doing, we show a lack of concern for our own well-being, but especially the well-being of others. We can be responsible too for a failure in our stewardship of creation itself, and the beauty of this island. And so before you now, we ask forgiveness. Forgiveness of the wrongs we have done, the hurt we have caused, the actions not done which should have been, and the things not said which should have been. And as we ask your forgiveness, we ask also the forgiveness and the patience of others. Grant us, we pray, the assurance of your forgiveness that we might be able to leave behind these faults and failings of the past, Free us from the guilt of acknowledgement of our wrongdoing. Help us into your future, your plans, your hopes for our own lives and for this, your world, for the society of which we are a part. Help us to discern your spirit acting in our lives, to look around us and see what needs attending to to follow more closely in your ways shown to us in Christ. That in so doing, as we grow closer to you, we may also grow closer to one another through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As I said, we're continuing with uh, Jeremiah, a reading today from chapter 32. Uh, it's, perhaps it seems a somewhat strange reason that it's largely a account of a property transaction, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to reflect positively on that. So Jeremiah builds a field during the siege. Doug's going to read for us this morning. Hear the word of God as we find in the Old Testament, Jeremiah chapter 32, reading verses one to three and then 6 through 15. Jeremiah 32, reading from verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the tenth year of King Zedekiah of Judah, which was the eighteenth year of Nebuchadre Nebuchadrezzar. Can I just start that one again? That's fine. He, he says, <laughs> would you read a lesson? There are no big words today. <laughs> The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the 10th year of King Zedekiah of Judah, which was the 18th year of Nebuchadrezzar. At that time, the army of the king of Babylon was besieging Jerusalem, <clears throat> and the prophet Jeremiah was confined in the court of the guard that was in the palace of the king of Judah, where the king Zedekiah of Judah had confined him. Zedekiah had said, Why do you prophesy and say, Thus says the Lord, I am going to give this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall take it. 
<clears throat> Jeremiah said, the word of the Lord came to me. Hanamel, son of your uncle Shalom, is going to come to you and say, buy my field that is as Anathoth, that is at Anathoth, for the right of redemption by purchase is yours. Then my cousin Hanamel came to me in the court of the guard in accordance with the word of the Lord and said to me, buy my field that is at Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, for the right of possession and redemption is yours. Buy it for yourself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. And I bought the field at Anathoth for my cousin Hanamel and weighed out the money to him, 17 shekels of silver. I signed the deed, sealed it, got witnesses, and weighed the money on scales. Then I took the sealed deed of purchase containing the terms and conditions and the open copy. And I gave the deed of purchase to Barak, son of Neriah, son of Messiah, in the presence of my cousin Hanamel, in the presence of the witnesses who signed the deed of purchase, and in the presence of all Judeans who were sitting in the court of the guard. In their presence I charged Barak, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Take these deeds, both this sealed deed of purchase and this open deed, and put them in an earthenware jar, in order that they may last for a long time. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. A time of music and of quiet reflection.
Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You may have felt this was rather a strange reading for a Sunday morning, essentially the details of a property uh, transaction involving Jeremiah. Let's again remember to put it in context. As I said just last week, it was in 597 that the first exiles were forced to leave Jerusalem because of the king Jehoiakim changing allegiances from Babylon to, to Egypt and then when going back again, part of the price of going back to to show his allegiance to Babylon was that many of the, the elite of the land were taken off into exile uh, in Babylon. This dates it nine years later um, in 588. And we know that by the fact that we're told that it was the 10th year of King Zedekiah now of Judah and the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar. In the intervening years, the state of Judah and Israel had again risen up against the empire of Babylon, and now they are paying the price for it. And the city of Jerusalem is besieged, and the land is now occupied. The whole of the land of Judah is now occupied by the Babylonian army. At the same time, Jeremiah is in prison. And the reason that he's in prison is that he has consistently and persistently warned what is to happen to the people of Judah and of Jerusalem. And King Zedekiah had felt that he was in a sense sapping the morale both of their armed forces and, and of the people generally. And the price for that was to be finding himself imprisoned. So that's the situation in which we find ourselves. And Jeremiah, it seems, has a vision that his cousin is going to come to him with the offer of a piece of land in Anathoth, the area in which uh, Jeremiah was born and, and brought up. And right enough, even during the siege, his cousin arrives and offers him this plot of land in Anathoth. Now, just remember the situation, and this is particularly perhaps relevant to those involved in the state agency. This is a piece of land that can only be conveyed to the next of kin, the closest of kin from its present owner, and that next of kin is Jeremiah. The land itself is a peasant farm. It's, it's not a great piece of land. It's presently under the control of the Babylonian Empire. They have invaded the land and, and they, they control it. Jeremiah is in prison. He's now approaching 70 years of age. He has no family, for he never married. And his cousin comes to him and said, I have a piece of land for you, would you like to buy it? And the obvious answer is, of course not. Of course not. Why on earth in the present circumstances would I buy this piece of land? But he does. And so the transaction that we have here is in very great detail laid out as to how he paid for and bought this piece of land and had it recorded. And the recording of it very carefully placed in safekeeping not just for a short time, but for, for many, many years. It was, if you like, Jeremiah's investment in the future. A future that he was not to be part of. Because eventually, after the besiege and the destruction of Jerusalem, as he had foretold, the very next year, sometimes afterwards, he's taken off to Egypt, where it is assumed that he, he died close to the age of 80. So it's an investment, not in his future, it's an investment in someone else's future, his people's future and, and the land. It's, if you like, can be compared to what was said to be a saying by the great reformer, uh, Martin Luther, who was asked, were told, was asked, what would you do if you were told the world was to end? And he said, I'd plant a tree. Now, unfortunately, it's never been able to be verified that he did ever say that. But the point has been made that if he didn't, well, he should have done, because it fits very well with his, with his whole theology and his, his understanding of, of his faith. It's an investment in the future. And this is Jeremiah's investment in the future. And it's interesting that in that context, the, the, the question has been asked, as I mentioned the other 
As I mentioned the other week, um, sadly perhaps, with the changes that are going to be impacting on the Church of Scotland, back in Scotland, many churches are going to be closed and properties will need to be disposed of. And it does raise the question that I wonder if congregations are able to do that in a positive way and make an investment in the future rather than see this as purely further evidence of decline and, and well, that's the end of it for me sort of thing. How do we invest? How do these churches that are perhaps slated for closure, how do they invest in the future? And for ourselves, in later years perhaps, do we give thought to that as to how we might invest some of our, our own resources? Not, not in our, our own or immediate future, but, but in, in a wider future, the, the future perhaps of our, of our society. So that's one thing that comes out of this uh, story of, of buying this plot of land. The other thing is this, after he does this, and after everything's signed and sealed and recorded and put away, <coughs> we're told that Jeremiah then goes into prayer. And it's an interesting prayer because it begins, Lord, nothing's too hard for you. <coughs> and then he recounts, <coughs> he then he recounts all that God has done for his people since the time of slavery in Egypt and their release and their escape from there and their being placed in a new land, a land of, of milk and honey and of prosperity. All that God has, has done for them and sometimes circumstances that, that seemed impossible. Nothing, Jeremiah says, is, is too hard for you. I know that. But buying this piece of land, <laughs> was this really such a good idea? And you can, you can see the, 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 the doubt that has crept that has crept into his mind. And then you get the response. You get the response from God. Yes, nothing is too hard for me. But goodness, it's harsh words. He says about Jerusalem, he says, this city has caused me nothing but anger and wrath since the moment it was built. And its people have fallen from my ways and yes, I will destroy it. And I will destroy the land of, of Judah. It's, it's fierce and it's, it's, it's harsh words. But again, he's on to say, yes, but nothing is too hard for me. And the day will come again when, as our passage today closed with the words, houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. So it's a word of hope and a word of, of promise uh, for the future. But in Jeremiah's circumstances, who would bet on that? Would you, would you bet on that? Nothing is too hard. He takes probably the resources he has and buys this peasant farm that in all likelihood he will never see in the hope that one day this God whom he worships and for whom he believes nothing is too hard will restore things and make things again new. Where would you place your bet? Would you bet in Jeremiah or would you bet in the power of the, of the Babylonian Empire and its armies? And that, that has something for us today as well in terms of the things that we maybe find are too hard. The problems that we sometimes encounter in our own lives, but also the problems we encounter in society. I think one of the things that has been revealed to us through the program that we've been involved in and giving out lunches for the last 15 months or so now is that we've come across people or situations that you look at and with the best will in the world you think, this is pretty hopeless. How do people get out of this situation in which they now found themselves? And many cl clearly find themselves in situations that, that do not have much obvious hope. It just, seems, it just seems too hard. And as a church, but more importantly as a society, how do we face up to the problems in this society that we think are just too hard? And problems that result in those amongst us that we perhaps rather were not there because they just present us with these problems. They're, it's there, it's in our face, we're, we're aware of it. It's just, it's just too hard. How do, how do we respond to that? And I close by just 
asking you this question in terms of where you'd place your bet, where you'd make your commitment. Where would you have placed that on the evening of that first Good Friday as Jesus is taken down from the cross? What were your thoughts? Where would you place your bet and your commitment then? Only to find that on Easter Sunday, indeed, nothing for God is too hard. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hymn 615, Holy Spirit, ever living is the church's very life. I, uh, <coughs> I appreciate it. It is difficult to sing with the masks on, but at the same time, it's good to hear hymns being sung again uh, in this sanctuary after what's been too long a time. Let us offer our prayers now of thanksgiving and our prayers for others. Let us pray. Almighty God, we give thanks for your many gifts and blessings to us in life. We give thanks for the past, for our own individual lives, and for all that has enriched them. The years of growing up, of family times, of friendships formed, the opportunities given to us, all in the past that we remember with fondness and happiness. But we give thanks too for the future and for the openness of the future and that which lies ahead of us. Unknown for us now, and almost certainly times of joy and celebration, but also times of sadness and loss. But we give thanks for that openness of the future which is yours, and your hopes and your desires for our own futures and for the future of this, your world. We reflect on those things which we would wish to see changed and commit ourselves to such change. Those things in our society that are not in accord with your vision for the way we should live together, the inequalities that we are faced with, the divisions which are part of our historical legacy, those things which do not enhance life but help detract from it. 
And so we commit ourselves to that future and to work for those things that you would have us commit to. And shown to us in the life and in the ministry of Christ, those whom he invited into fellowship that others wished would have just gone away. The sharing of resources that was unequal in his time as it is in ours and his concern for the poorest and the most vulnerable. As we offer our prayers for others, may we be guided by his ministry and his actions. We pray this day for our families, whatever they may be, some of whom we have not seen for too long a time now. And we look forward for the day when we will be with them again. May your blessing be upon them. We pray for our friends, for the members of this congregation, and especially for those for whom this is a difficult time. There are those who have been bereaved. There are others who are caring for family members struggling with illness, with Alzheimer's, with dementia, and all the strains that that puts on families and on carers. There are others too who are lonely and anxious and have found these last months difficult times. We pray for the day when we may be property, properly reunited and share again physically fe fellowship and friendship. But give thanks for the opportunities through modern technologies at the same time to be with others. We pray for those who have suffered trauma in recent days. We remember with sadness the collapse of that, uh, that residential site in Miami. The dreadful fires in British Columbia are now spreading into the center of that country. And others who are facing trauma of whatever kind, of war and of civil war, of that dreadful violence and cruelty that separates us from one another and leaves so many victims. We pray for the refugees in this your world, those who are fleeing such violence, those who are fleeing the appalling circumstances in their own country in the hope at times of a better life for themselves and for their families and for others to the holding in refugee camps. And for those that govern us, may they too commit themselves to a better future for the societies and for the nations which they represent. May they and we show a real concern to overcome all that divides us, to work for a society more fashioned to your word. And we pray too for your church, of which we are but a small part but that we may play our part in the building of your kingdom. And always we remember those no longer with us, but whose love we were privileged to know and to receive, and who rest safe now in your keeping. May we never think them far from us, for we share a communion and a fellowship with them still, through the mystery of the fellowship and communion that we have in you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Rather than physically receive the offering, there is an opportunity at each door of, of offering plates. Again, I thank all those who contribute in whatever way to the further work of the church. We offer now our prayers of dedication and the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, in your name, we dedicate this, our offering, and all our offerings of time, of talents, and of money, praying that they may be symbols of our commitment to live in your way and to work for the signs and the growth of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray together now and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. In 562, through the love of God our Saviour, all will be well. Now go in peace, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you and all whom you love, this day and always. Amen. Perhaps we could also close in singing, Go Now in Peace. <laughs>